I want to share with you a couple of important things about transfiguration. Unfortunately, sometimes when we talk about transfiguration, we go into the deep theological concepts of why Christ transfigured, what did he show his divinity to us, and this and that. That's good and well. That's up to him. And that's for our salvation through him, by him. But what is our part in the transfiguration? If you look at the icon of transfiguration, transfiguration symbolizes transformation. And it is very appropriate that in the icon, the apostles are upside down. Because transfiguration, rather transformation, simpler word, change, turns us upside down. We don't want it. We can't handle it. Well, we go upside down. We go on our heads. And that's what the disciples saw. They saw change of Christ. He was that dusty man who walked with them everywhere in Jerusalem. All of a sudden, all the dust went away and emerged from it the divinity. They saw Christ transformed, transfigured. They saw the man now being God. And that's what happens with us when we hear about transformation. Because transformation is not necessarily having this and doing that and changing this and building that. Transformation is an inside-out thing. We need to change from inside out. Like the cocoon that stays in that little uh, thing and then eventually turns into a butterfly. That's what trans transformation, transfiguration symbolizes. My grandmother always used to tell me, uh, when I told her my arm hurts, my leg hurts, it was just a little thing, she would tell me, it's growing pains. Well, growth is transformation. When we grow up, it hurts. Well, unfortunately, she's not around so that I can tell her that when I sit down, I can't get up anymore. My back hurts. That's not growing pain anymore. That's getting old pain, right? So, what does it mean? It means that changing is painful. Changing is hard. It's difficult. Remember my grandmother again. When I was a teenager, high school kid, one day, I lived, I lived with my grandmother three years because she was alone. My grandfather had just passed, on, and this month actually on the 18th, he passed away. I still remember like today. And I had to go live with my grandmother because she was alone. And one day I had the brilliant idea of making, getting a fish tank. She said, no, you can't have a fish tank. My like, grandma, come on, why not? Well, no, I don't want a fish tank in the house. I said, why? Explain to me. Anyways, I convinced her. I brought the fish tank, and then, as you know, the fish tank needs a light. So I put a little light on it. Oh boy, she came in. Why is that light on? I said, well, because the fish needs light. No, you can't have a light on. But grandma, why not? Because it uses too much electricity. Oh boy, so what am I going to do now? The fish will die. So I said, I tried to convince you. She, she wouldn't agree, she wouldn't agree. And then finally I said, how about this? I called my dad and asked him to pay for that electricity that this little lamp will use so that you don't have to worry about it. She's like, no, no, I don't want it. But grandma, how about I ask my father that pays all the electricity we use in the house. The bill goes directly to him and he pays all of it. She's like, no. So then I realized it wasn't really the bill. It wasn't really the money issue. It wasn't a money issue. It was a change issue. She couldn't bear change. And later on, I, as I grew up, I, uh, I started to ponder it never left me. Why couldn't she agree with this? And I remember she telling me stories about her life when she was a young girl, 13, 12 to 13 years old. She told me three stories about her life. Number one, she was Ukrainian, from Ukraine. And when she was 12, that's when the war started, the World War II. And the Germans came, she said, and wiped out everything we had. All the fields, all the grain fields that we're fighting now, the grain that we have to ship to Africa. All those grain fields were burned and trotted under the wheels of the tanks. 
she said that winter we had to eat so much sunflower seed opening by our teeth and she showed me her tooth it was caved it was a v-shape she said that's why it's v-shaped because i had eaten so many sunflower seeds all over the winter it wore out my tooth even worse she said the year before we had plenty of potatoes so much that we couldn't eat ukraine is a wealthy country right that's the breadbasket of Europe. She said, we had so much at the, in, in the spring, in order to get rid of it, we dug this big trench and put all the potatoes in it and covered it with dirt. We're going to get more, right, in the summer? Well, not really, because the Germans came and destroyed everything. So she said, when the fall came, we had no potatoes. She said, somebody had the bright, brilliant idea of going and digging out those potatoes that we buried last year. Half of the village got poisoned and died because they were rotted already. And then she told me another story. She said one day I was going home from work. She worked for a, a collective farm, the communist collective farm. She said we were so hungry. I had five brothers and sisters who were much younger than me at home waiting for me to bring something home. On the way, she said, I found this piece of bread that the tire of a car had gone over it. The top of it was dirty. The bottom of it was sunk into the mud. She said, I took it off the ground very gently, and I knew that was precious. But she said, I was so hungry. I wanted to eat it right away. But then I remember, what about my brothers and sisters at home? So she said, I decided to eat the dirty part, the top that had dirt on it, and the bottom that had dirt on it and take that clean part, the middle part, to my brother, brothers and sisters, five of them, when he was home. The last story she told me, she said one day, one of those days when I was working in a farm, I knew there was nothing at home for my brothers and sisters. My father was in the war, and my mother was home with the five kids. She said, I decided I was a brilliant idea of stealing some grain. So she said, I took a handful of wheat, I put it in my pocket with my friend, and we went home. That evening, she said, the Gestapo was looking for those two girls. A neighbor came running to her house and said to her mother, they just took my daughter. They're coming after yours. You should save her. So the poor girl, 12 years old, was taken to the train station, put in a coal train, and sent to Siberia for her life. She grew up in Siberia, met my grandfather who was a prisoner in war and exiled by communists into Siberia because he should have died, not become a prisoner. That's what they said. So they met there and got married. So after I knew all these stories about my grandmother, I knew there was something stuck in her heart. She had extreme fear of spending even a penny more than she needs. Otherwise, she may experience the same things that she experienced when she was 12 years old. It was very hard for her. And she experienced the second hunger when she was 80 years old. Armenia went into deprivation of everything. What was the best thing about her? She had stored so much food in her closet that she was eating it for two years. Everybody out there was getting hungry. My grandfather, my grandmother even had honey in her closet. Because when the times were good, that fear had made her like a you know, pack rat, store food in her closet, boxes of them, honey and soap and everything. When I was going in the closet, it was like a supermarket. When the supermarkets were empty, when you go to the supermarket, there was just a guy standing there, there was nothing to buy. In my grandmother's closet, there was everything you needed. In a very orderly way, she would just go in there and pick the thing. And she would sparingly use it, so that for two years, she still had honey. So what does this mean? It means that when we get stuck, it can be good, it can be bad, but transformation is necessary. Transfiguration is necessary. Letting go of those things that have hurt us in the past is very important for our liberation, for being free. 
And so I want to bring your attention, and I'm sorry I'm talking too much, but this is very important. I want to bring our attention to our Lord's expression. When he talks about Christians as sheep, and he says, wolves will come in and devour you. And he talks about sheep, uh, wolves with a skin of sheep. What does that mean? Transformation, transfiguration, does not mean to hide what's inside of us. When we are a wolf inside, we need to expose the wolfishness and try to transform it into humanness, into, I don't want to call sheepishness, because it doesn't sound right, but to humility of a, of a, a sheep, of a lamb. Christ compared himself to a lamb. To become humble, to become kind, not violent and aggressive like a wolf. But like my grandmother, who had experienced this kind of terrible things in her life, sometimes aggression is the only protection we get. We are aggressive towards everyone so that we don't get hurt again. So why did Jesus compare his disciples to sheep? Because when we are like sheep as a community, we have one shepherd who is Christ, and we follow him everywhere. And he takes us and cares for us, and he takes us to the green pastures and springs of water, and he takes best care of us. And he loves us, and he re is ready to die for us. He's died for us already. That's the kind of relationship we have amongst us as sheep of God, and we have that kind of relationship with him. That's what helps communities to transfigure. The relationship amongst ourselves, a loving relationship. Have you ever seen sheep in the, in the fields when it's too hot? What do they do? They huddle together and help each other to stay cool. When one of them is attacked by a dog or something, they will all surround the dog and attack them. They can't hurt the dog, but they will protect their flock. So transfiguration and transformation happens when people, communities, are together, united amongst themselves, and they follow one leader who is Christ himself. Well, when I, recently, when I uh, was thinking about this wolf idea amongst uh, sheep, I went and studied wolves. But why did Christ say wolves? Why couldn't he say lions or jackals or something else, right? And then I remembered, actually, an Armenian poet was walking up the street alone. He was a genius. And he had a bunch of enemies. And they were coming across. And they started making fun of him. And he, they said, oh, master, quotation, you're walking alone, as if you don't have friends, right? We have friends. We're, we're together. And he very humbly looked at them and said, yes, he said, lions walk alone, wolves and jackals in packs. And he passed by. So there is a difference. That's why Christ didn't say, be careful from the lions, because that wasn't the point. So when I studied the wolves, I came across to this concept. A wolf usually is a pack. Well, sheep are packed too, right? Not really. In the sheep pack, there is no order. Everybody is a sheep. Everybody is equal. They have a shepherd who is the shepherd, and the rest is a herd. In the wolf pack, there is intelligence. Sheep don't have intelligence. They don't have the pride of the wolf. They are reliant on their master, who is the shepherd, who is Christ himself. But the wolves have intelligence, and they have order in the pack. Usually, there is an alpha male or a female, or male and a female alpha, who are leading the pack. Everybody is obedient to them and afraid of them. If ever they dare to do anything against the leader, they would be hurt. What's worse, in the wolf pack, there's also an omega wolf. Can you believe that? I never knew that. There's alpha wolf, which is the leader, and then there's an omega wolf. 
Usually what happens with Omega Wolf starves to death because they don't let him eat. Everybody eats, the Alpha eats, and then the rest of the pack eats, and the Omega dies from hunger, usually. So what happens with the Omega when they die? Somebody else becomes Omega. The, the last one in the pack steps right into that position of starvation. And the Alpha and Omega lead the pack. So when wolves in skins of sheep enter into the sheepfold, all the order is disrupted. There's no more relationships. The sheep are in panic. They go everywhere in, 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 in distress. And the wolf devours them eventually. Why do they put skins of sheep? Because sometimes the shepherd will have one sheep in the fall that will hear his voice and come after him. And what happens? That's the only thing that sheep does, that one leader sheep does. Just hear the voice of the Lord and follow to the, his voice. And the rest of the sheep will follow that one sheep. Not that that sheep is telling them where to go. That sheep is simply going to the voice of the Lord. And everybody else, the master, the, the, the shepherd, and everybody else goes after them. So when a wolf appears, they scatter the sheep. And they cover themselves with the skin of a sheep. Because how do wolves eat sheep, you know? Sheep are sheepish, right? Very sheepish. The wolves will come into the pack. I've been a shepherd when I was a boy. That's why I know all these things. They'll come into the pack, and they will not hurt anybody. They'll just mix with them. The sheep will start to get stressed, and then they will start running away. And the sheep will think that they are chasing them away. They're chasing the wolf away. They're, they're, they're strong. And eventually the wolf will lead them away from, the, from their pasture into the woods and destroy them over there. So that's why uh, our Lord uses that example. Because in order for communities, for churches to transform, they need to be in healthy relationship with their shepherd. Because the shepherd washes them, shears them. The shepherd leads them into pastures, into green pastures, into waters. And the wolf devours them. And sometimes, unfortunately, the wolf are covered in sheepskin and we cannot identify them. But our hope and transformation is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit through whom the Lord guides us to His salvation, to His kingdom, now and forever, into the ages of ages. Amen. May God bless you.